I'm ready. Okay. So I'm James and I founded the hub and this is William and he's one of the top photographers on the hub. And I've recently been calling a lot of our top photographers just to get to know them better, to learn, to make sure that the hub is doing what its mission says, which is really to be an advocate for photographers. And William and I had a really intense conversation. It was meant to be a half an hour. It ended up being almost an hour and a half. And I basically said, hey, we got to have this conversation again on camera because there are a lot of photographers I've spoken to with the same gripes, with the same uh, complaints or observations about the industry and about how the hub participates in that narrative. And so the hope is that through this conversation, we can, there's really one main thing that we're going to focus on today, which is the cost of content and making sure that photographers are valued appropriately for the work that they're putting in. Um, and so we're just going to kind of riff a little bit, William and I, as the guy who started the platform and as one of the photographers who's sort of benefiting most from the platform and also benefiting the platform most through all of your incredible work. We're going to try to just build this argument and see where we net out. Um, so I guess let's, let me turn it over to you, William. And why don't, why don't you articulate sort of what you did to me, which is like, wh what is, what is the gripe here? Or what is the observation about the, the cost of content, either as an observation about the industry or about your experience with the hub more specifically? Yeah, I think that um, to start off, I'm a photographer, I'm an advertising and commercial photographer. So I kind of can only speak specifically to the shoots that I've experienced with where they're the advertising, the commercial stuff. This is like, I, I don't know other parts of the industry. Like I cannot speak for people that are shooting wildlife. I can't speak for people that are doing like the very specific situations, but for me as a photographer who works predominantly with brands and with companies that are creating content and images to make sales at the end of the day, I think that a lot of times I'm wearing a lot of hats and a lot of times I'm doing a lot of things. And I, I just don't know if the brands are really aware and uh, I don't know if they're really aware with of how much is going into the shoot. And I just feel like sometimes the creators and the content creators aren't being paid um, industry standard. They're not being paid what, th what they're working for. And I think that the, I, I hesitate in using words like gripe because I think that that um, puts a, like an instant negative connotation to it. And like, um, yeah, I, I, mean, I made you sound like a complainer and you, you weren't complaining. Yeah, it was yeah. just more of a, and yeah. I, I think it's more of an observation and just like more of a common thread that I'm seeing through brands where they want the world but they're really only willing to pay for like a third of it type of deal so i guess my main observation would just be like how do we educate clients how do we converse with clients so everyone feels like it's a win-win and then how do we kind of create a line of communication with other photographers and other creative content creators to to make sure that we're all for like lack of better term like in it together um and then earlier we kind of spoke about like it, like almost like needing a union type of deal and I, I don't think that we're at that point yet but i think that just starting off with like a line of communication from photographer to photographer is the first step because i i think that a lot of people like they uh, you you mentioned it before james where it's like content or it's creative insecurity and like if you talk to another photographer like they can take your job, they can take your clients. Or like, if you talk to another photographer, like you're automatically going to be at like butting heads with them. And, and I don't, I don't think that that's true. I think that knowledge is power. And if you just communicate with people, then we'll be able to all have that same discussion together. So it's not, we're not so in our own lanes. Like I, I feel like right now we're all in our own lanes going the same direction. And it would just be smarter for us to all talk and educate clients and like kind of have an open conversation about what the industry is doing, where it's going, the positives of that and the negatives and worries of that. I know. Totally. That I, no, I, I, no, that was really well put. And I took some notes on what you said. Um, 
there are just three things I want to quickly address before I ask you a few questions. So one is that we're in our own lanes. And I don't want to sound too poetic or abstract by saying this, but I think this is a phenomena of social media and technology. You know, this is something people talk about a lot. It's sort of a, a trope. It's a little bit of a cliche. Like, we're, we're more connected than ever before, and yet we're all alone, just as, as human beings. Forget photographers for a second. And then when you, when you think about photographers in our industry, like, once again, we're all on like Instagram. We all follow each other. We all kind of know who each other is. And yet, once again, all feeling a little bit alone or like there's some sort of competition or a zero sum game, meaning if William wins, Jessica loses. If Jessica wins, mm -hmm. Stephanie loses. And it's sort of like um, competitive. And um, one of the goals of the hub, we started as a community with no way to make money. It was literally just meetups and dinner parties and so on is to create that community. And I think something we're really focused on now is having these dialogues. You know, you're on a Slack channel with 20 other of our top photographers on the platform now. And um, how do we unionize? I, I do think that's a good word. Um, and it's also a good segue into the next thing you, you said. One of the early words you used was industry standard. We're being paid below industry standard. And I would, I would reframe that and I would say, there is no industry standard. There is an old number for what photography was five or 10 years ago, which was an entirely different beast. You know, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, we're talking about shooting on film or very early digital cameras, like the processes were very different. Um, the, the means of publication was very different. So if someone like you wanted work, you needed an agent. Now Instagram is your agent or the hub is your agent. Like you, you, there are certain expenses and whether it's developing film or paying an agent a commission, you don't have those expenses anymore. Um, and brands have changed a lot too. Brands used to have to sell their product using billboards and sell them through a big retailer. Um, now they sell them on a website using Facebook ads. So the world has changed a lot. And so even if it's still a photographer shooting for a brand and it seems like the same old story, it couldn't be more different in terms of what that photographer looks like and how she acts and what her process is and what that brand looks like and how they mm -hmm. act and what their process is. So I think we have an op opportunity to actually define the industry standard. I don't think mm -hmm. photographers are being paid below or above the industry standard because I don't think there is one for this new world that we're all living in. Sure, so that's, and I, I, do, I yeah. do agree with that. Like I can definitely see how because there was such a fast and abrupt industry shift, like um, I, th I I kind of see it as two different shifts where we saw a really big departure from film really quickly. Like the second that it came out, it, a lot of people jumped on that digital train and a lot of photographers were left in the dust. A lot of photographers are not working anymore because they weren't able to be flexible. They weren't able to change and they weren't able to make that move. And then I think quickly after digital, we had a social media um, boom and a lot of a lot of digital photographers um i hesitate in saying older even though i i assume that if we look at the numbers it would be older photographers that weren't able to jump on that train weren't able to stay on that train and they weren't able to be flexible and change for that shift um so i, I do agree that there is definitely a new industry standard i also think that it's i think that it's um risky and i think that it's um troubling to just uh, completely abandon what the historical industry standard was because i think that even though we know it's different and we know that it's changing and that we do have the opportunity to kind of change that i think that it's that age-old um phrase of like don't let history repeat itself like knowing history stops it from repeating i think that you do need to know where you came from i think that you do need to know what that old industry standard was to be able to create a foundation and a base so you're not just floating and grasping at straws. So I, I do agree that it's completely changed and I, I do agree that it's different and that we have the opportunity to change it, but I think that it would be foolish to not take historically what's happened into account. Um, really really so, quick on that point, um, 
you mentioned the transition from film to digital and then, and then uh, the explosion of social media. I'm gonna go one step further, which is I think the sort of result of those two things when you add them together is everyone's a photographer. Actually, and maybe the iPhone is another one, right? Like everyone, thanks to the iPhone and Instagram filters, is a photographer. Mm -hmm. And so whereas like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, if, you're, if you want to be a photographer, you need like mastery of your craft. Sure. You need or, to like it, it was a, or it was a buy-in. You physically had to have the five grand to buy year. a camera. Yeah, indeed. So like master, like you have to understand, like there are many photographers that are successful photographers. I know that make 50, 60, 70, hundred K a year that I bet you, if, if you said like, explain to me the relationship between like what F stop you're shooting at and, and like what ISO you're shooting at, they wouldn't be able to explain that to you. Um, and so 15 years ago, there was a barrier to entry, as you say, $5,000 for the year, um, probably a lot more than that in either formal schooling or apprenticeship in understanding how everything works. Um, and now there's been a flooding of the market where there's so much supply. I have an, a, a very crass analogy for you that's coming to mind. And there are a couple of analogies we shared on our first phone call. This wasn't one of them. Have you seen the movie American Gangster? No. Okay. But tell, but tell me anyway. It's a good movie. It's about, it's about this guy who basically ran the streets in 1980s New York and like owned the, the heroin market. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when he entered the market, there was a huge heroin epidemic, particularly in Harlem. And there were lots and lots and lots of drugs out there. And they were cut with other stuff. And so they were only like 40% heroin and, and mostly fluff. And he basically figured out how to get 100% pure heroin from Vietnam and was able to put that into the market and he cut his cost. So he was the cheapest heroin on the market and like over two times as potent and everyone went to him. But for a while, there was just this flooding of like heroin's everywhere. It's dirt cheap. Everyone's taking mm -hmm. it. Everyone's addicted to it. And I think that's what's happened with this social media uh, you know, Instagram filters, everyone's a photographer, everyone absorbs thousands of images a day, whether they realize it or not. And so your expertise, however amazing it is, has been homogenized, has been lost in this ocean mm -hmm. of content. So the question you're asking is sort of like, I'm still better though. Like I still have the expertise. So how how does the market value just like this guy frank is his name in the movie just like he had a better heroin product people came to realize that and he ended up winning in the end but how do you get people that are sort of addicted to sort of like a watered down shitty version of what you do very well how do you get them to realize that your version of the co of content is that much better and therefore that much worth paying for. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that, I think that he, I, I don't know the movie, but I, I'm assuming that he made himself a brand. He made himself the go-to. Like, I think the only way to get around for lack of a better term, like the fluff at the bottom is to separate yourself and make yourself stand out. And, uh, like I said, I I can't speak for that character, but like I would make myself the brand and I would make my expertise and my experience and knowledge the selling point. Like I don't, when I market myself, I don't market myself as a human with a finger that can take a picture with a camera. I market myself as a photographer with experience and knowledge and and the ability to turn your brand into something that you need it to be. Like I'm not, I'm not selling my camera and my pointer finger pressing a button. I'm selling what's in my head. And I'm selling my creativity and my experience. And do you I think, think that, do you think the brands in the, in the industry, do you think like the brands out there, let's call it in the, let's, let's just take Instagram for a second. Cause you said, mm -hmm. forget wildlife photography. Let's just really focus in on like the photographers that are on Instagram and the brand, the up and coming brands mostly, let's just even make it very simple. Brands in the food and beverage space on Instagram, photographers who are food photographers on Instagram. Do you think those brands that are high off of 
very watered down like heroin that's been cut with cornstarch do you think they are aware enough of what makes you special and different when you do describe yourself and what's in your brain and why you're better does that fall on deaf ears or do they actually respond to that no i think well in my experience i think that i've been very very lucky and very fortunate to be able to have open conversations with clients where my clients i we've had the discussion where like sometimes they know they just need the instagram shot and they're like william we get it like you you just laid out this treatment and you did all this writing and creative pre-pro but like at the end of the day dude we need a shot of the can outside holding it up with a hand like just do it come back to us later like all we need is instagram but then those same clients still know that when they do need that larger shoot, when they do need a road trip where they've rented a car and they have four people, like they also know that I'm capable of doing that. So I'm not selling myself as just the cornstarch heroin. I'm saying that I can get you cornstarch heroin, but I can also get you right. 100%. It's almost like you're and, saying, like I, I think of the, the dad who has a Ferrari and he's got to take his kid to school, right? And he's going to drive 30 miles an hour to get there. And it's a goddamn Ferrari. Like he could be going 200 miles an hour, but the kid's in the car, it's rush hour, everyone's going to school. He's just driving 10 and two to get to school. But that same dad in that same car can then get on the highway and he can go 200 miles an hour. Sure. Right? I, I think I, I agree with you. I think the difference is that the clients and the brands also understand that if they just need the $250 Instagram shot, that's a, for me, it's, it's, that's a different cost than if they need the bigger shoe. It's the same. It's, <clears throat> it's again, it's still me. I'm still marketing my creativity and my experience. Um, but it's a different cost for me doing a two hour shoot with no pre pro and just having it be um, more instinctual. I don't have to prepare for stuff like that as much. So I don't need to be paid for that preparation versus me doing four days of pre production, doing two, a two day shoot and then a one day wrap day. Like that's still my brain. I still have my bottom line. I still have my bottom number. But you're paying me the, you're you're paying a difference in you pay for what you get you're paying a difference in those two shoots whereas i think the ferrari you still paid the same price for that ferrari regardless of how you use it that's not a win for the dad that's not a win for ferrari i think the only person winning there is the kid getting dropped off in a ferrari <laughs> and i don't want to be that kid so, so i think that understanding that i think that's actually another big Another big idea that I would like to get across to photographers and clients and, and people is that this industry is so fluid and so flexible that it's, it's I, I actually get really, we have not discussed this, but I get really um, ticked off at like uh, packages or like price, like a price sheet. Um, I think that it works in certain industries, specifically like weddings. Like if you're hiring a wedding photographer, you want to have the prices there, but I don't have a price sheet. I don't have a template for my shoot. Each shoot that I do is dependent on what you need as a brand. And like I said, sometimes it is just the can at the beach and it costs 300 bucks because I'm there for an hour and a half. And then sometimes it's a full on campaign where we're driving yeah. from here to Joshua Tree. That's why on the hub, you know, a lot of, a lot of clients are pressuring us to fix in pricing. We have a competitor called Suna S O O N A. Mm -hmm. And they just say it's $39 a photo period. End of story. That's what the clients pay. I think they pay 25 bucks a photo to a photographer. So someone like you does a whole shoot, you make 250 bucks, which I think, I don't know what the industry standard is again, but to me that strikes me as, is highway robbery. Like that's terrible. Sure. Right. Um, but Clients are constantly asking us, like, we want standardized pricing. And, and my pushback is always what you just said, which is it's so bespoke. There are so many variables at play. Are there three models or two? Do we need a location? Do we not? Do we need, what kind of lighting do we need? How many images do you want? Like, will William have to buy other ingredients or props? Like, there's so many moving parts 
you know, how much of his time pre-pro, how much time like in, like in Photoshop editing and retouching, like all of these things inform how much a, a, a body of work will cost. And so it needs to be an open market. It needs to be a dialogue. I, I, I totally agree. Um, and it can't be just locked in because I think that it really ends up hamstringing the photographer in an unfair way. So just while I'm on this point, William, you know, something we talked about was where do clients on the hub come from? So the average shoot on the hub is $740. And it's sort of this weird Goldilocks price point because some of the people paying that, when I ask on sales calls, like where did you make your content in the past? Or what are your other options to create content, Mr. Client? And they say, either we worked with an agency that was charging us $4,000 a shoot and it isn't worth the money and we're shopping around for another solution. Or they say, mm -hmm. I worked with an influencer on Instagram who shot with her iPhone and the quality isn't there. Or my friend, Steven, who I went to college with, I think he has like a Nikon or something. I don't know. He, uh, he just shot it for me in his free time and charged me like 300 bucks, but like, it's not that good. So they're either coming from the, I paid basement bargain pricing to some idiot, mm -hmm. whether it's an influencer or like my buddy from college or my neighbor or some shit, or I paid an agency to kind of like scout me and they want that Goldilocks in the middle mm -hmm. and Suna and us and a couple other platforms are becoming that Goldilocks in the middle where it's like, it's a little bit more than your buddy Dave from college. It's way less than the agency, but the quality's there. And it's that middle road. And then within- the, I, the, I would, the, the, I would the venture last, to say- Go ahead. No, go for it. I was no, just no, gonna no, say go. the, last thing, the last thing I was gonna say is like within that middle road, I think they're actually roads. With, it's like a highway with lanes. And soon as doing the like, we're really cheap and standardized, AKA fuck creators, we're here to make it really easy for brands because you know exactly what you're paying. It's super transparent and super easy. And I'm kind of taking the high road. I don't know if there's going to be a middle one, but I'm taking the high road of like, we're creators first, we're quality first, but I hear you on the agency charging you four grand for an image that you're going to use on Facebook ads for two days or on Instagram before it gets buried in your feed. And it's not worth the four grand. So I hear you on that. So it's mm -hmm. got to be somewhere in the middle. And so I want to be way above Dave, the college friend. I want to be above Suna, the $39 photo, like lock in fuck creators. I want to be mm -hmm. above both of those for sure but I need to be below the agency where they're scratching their head being like, why did I pay four grand for an image that lived on my Instagram for six days and then got buried in my feed? Why did I do that? Mm -hmm. And I, to, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I have a few points on that. So I'm going to try and get them all before I forget them. But I, I agree that there does need to be that Goldilocks. I'm worried that the companies like Suna and there's a company out here in LA that's very similar. I am scared that they're what, not. What are they called? They're, they're called, uh, I actually don't know what they're called. It's a few different umbrellas. Like one of them is called Candid and then another one is We Are Matt Black and stuff like that. And I- I know the Matt Black guys. Yep, keep going. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know if they're any better than the influencers or the Buddy Dave. Like, I, I don't know if they're, I don't think their quality is better and I don't think their price point is better. Like you, like you said, your example of, I had my buddy Dave that had maybe an icon, he charged me $300. What's the difference between Suna charging $300? Like that's, it's, there's no, that to me is not Goldilocks. That's just them rebranding their buddy Dave. So they get a cut of Dave's 300 where I think, that, I, I think, I think, I think that, it's far, I think it's far worse than that, man. I, we, we agree, but I'm just going to try to modify what you said a little bit, which is here's the scariest thing. I think Suna is your evil twin, which is a talented photographer who has tried to hold his ground and say, damn it, I'm worth a thousand dollars. Pay me a thousand dollars. And brands are saying like, nah, we can go into Suna 
And so at some point your evil twin goes, fuck it. I'll just go on to Suna. I'll set up some seamless. I'll get a tripod. I'll put my fucking camera down. I'll get three or four or five jobs a day. Bing, 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 bing. I'll make 200 bucks uh, or, or, or 150 bucks a shoot. And when I add up all th those shoots, I make 600 bucks a day. And so I make my living, but it's creatively devoid. I'm dying inside mm -hmm. and I hate my life. So I actually don't think it's Dave, the clueless like buddy from college. I unfortunately think it's someone with your talent level that couldn't find the Goldilocks tried sure. to hold his I ground and got fucked. Totally agree. And that, that totally makes agree. me, that makes me sad, man. Totally agree. And again, this, this goes back into what I was saying. Like historically we call those stock photographers where they have a studio that has, I'm not exaggerating. I've been there. I've seen it. I, I work with Getty often and I've seen some of these Getty photographers set up and they've got 10 different tables. Each table has a different color backdrop or a different texture. And a company will come in. I, I, I'll only speak for the, the specific one time that I was in there. It was the kitchenware company. It was um, like kitchen utensils, like spatulas and whisks and stuff. And they took the whisk and they did two frames on the red, two frames on the yellow, two frames on the wood, two frames on the marble. And boom, boom, boom. They shot that kitchen company for two hours and then they moved to another brand. And at the end you, of the day, it was stock photography. W and William, industry, William, do you know what this reminds me a lot of? Because you made this analogy earlier and I think it's brilliant right here in the conversation. I wrote an article three years ago. So you know that I'm not full of shit. Okay. Three years ago called the hub is starting the slow content movement. Do you know mm -hmm. what the slow food movement is? Mm-mm. So before you were talking about Whole Foods, right? Before mm -hmm. we started recording, the slow food movement is like factory farming, processed foods, faster, 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 cheaper, 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 faster, 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 cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. That's what caused every box on the shelf to be processed like corn that makes us all fat and our whole country have diabetes. Uh, mm -hmm. Factory farming when chickens are in little cages just laying eggs all day and they're like completely dead inside like that's where food went to and then mm -hmm. and then there was this moment where everyone's like let's slow down this is getting fucking scary we need to have high nutrition high integrity local like not fast factory farming but local mm -hmm. high integrity stuff and i think that's where content is which is why i wrote this three years ago you just described a factory farm it, instead of Again, chickens 100 percent. instead of chickens laying eggs you just described photographers being forced at gunpoint basically it's like hey do you want to eat uh just bang out photos red yellow blue backdrops whisks spatulas it, it's soulless and so whole foods though it's sort of evil in its own right that's a conversation for another day has breathed life in a mass market way back into integrity and quality ingredients and local ingredients and organic and so on. And just like eating Kraft macaroni and cheese, though it's delicious, it makes you feel like shit because it's this neon orange sodium filled garbage. Mm -hmm. you, you need to eat nutritious food and brands need to have nutritious content that's made with love and care and not made in a factory farm. I agree. So the Goldilocks that will win in my opinion, and I think this is where we really agree is the Goldilocks that doesn't give in, that isn't just a factory farm with a nice, like uh, shiny sign outside that makes it seem like they're not torturing chickens. Mm -hmm. It's actually like the Whole Foods. It's how do we do this in a thoughtful, sustainable, local, nu nutrient dense way? Mm -hmm. what, what do you what do you think of that? I know I totally agree. I think that the difference is that in the industry right now for the, for the food industry, for the slow food industry, is that people have realized that fast food is almost unanimously bad. Like people get that like you can't eat McDonald's every day and live a good life you've got to have some of like this nutrient dense stuff i think the difference is that in the photo industry somewhere along the line we lost that concept of like 
oh, stock photographers suck. Like back in the day, stock photographers sucked. It was like, no one wants to be paparazzi. No one wants to be stock photographers. And I think that somewhere along the lines, I don't know if photographers lost that. I think that brands lost that. Brands forgot or lost their way or like somehow didn't stay on that track of like, these are bullshit images. We shouldn't be paying for them. But dude, or, but dude, or same with we, same we, with the same with the American food consumer. Like they, for when you were a kid and I was a kid, like my parents are educated, and I, I'm looking at a garden actually right outside this window, a vegetable garden that my mom grew. But they took me to fast food, and w- when I went to sp- you know soccer on the weekends, we'd stop and get Gatorade and combos and processed food, like. Uh, the American public just wasn't educated. And and here's the analogy. Like here's, I think where, what, this is what I think the solution is. And I think we're in agreement here. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. If a little food brand that made like organic fill in the blank, organic blueberries, mm-hmm. instead of real or, or organic, um, you know, granola bars. Okay and they charge 10 bucks a box. And the really shitty granola bar brand that's sold in Costco charges five bucks a box. The granola bar brand is like 10 bucks, it's worth it, you're killing yourself slowly. The consumer's like, this granola bar box is way too uptight and crazy and trying to convince me of complete bullshit. I'm just gonna go over here and, you know, I'm at Costco, right? But it takes a Whole Foods being like everything on the shelves, everything is quality here. You're safe mm-hmm. here. And we're going to put a flag in the ground that food, not just granola bars, but blueberries, granola bars, fish, you name it, should be local and thoughtfully totally made. Agree. And, totally and agree. then that gives room for all the brands that are sold in Whole Foods to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And put their flags in the ground and be like, yeah, granola bars, cold brew coffee, matcha, da, 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 all mm-hmm. this stuff, quinoa. And that's how all these trends have grown, all these food trends. So the, the analogy is this, William. If you, a photographer on Instagram, started DMing brands and being like, I'm a high quality photographer. You're slowly killing yourself by doing this like soulless stock photography shit. Pay $1,500, damn it. Stop paying $200. You are killing yourself. They're going to say, fuck you. There are 18 other photographers behind you who will do it for cheaper. Get out of the way. But if you have True. Whole Foods market and they're, and they're in the aisles and everything in the aisles, everything is saying to them, you're slowly killing yourself. You should buy organic, organic, local, local, organic, sustainable. Then suddenly Whole Foods completely changed the way people thought True. about food. And now like I'm not going to feed my kid processed food and not in a million years. And it's not because I'm better than my parents. It's just because I grew up in this like woke whole foods age where I'm educated on nutrition and my parents didn't. Agreed. So I think that, I think that, I think that for your point though, I'm being a, let's just say, let's just call me a whole foods photographer. I'm not going to go into a Ralph's or a Safeway and try and convince people that are already in that Ralph's and Safeway to come into Whole Foods and buy my photography. Right. I'm, and this, I'm going to specifically be looking for the people through my marketing, through my outreach, not necessarily DMs, because that's like a fucking Ralph thing to do. Be a photographer, have a marketing campaign, use Squarespace's email, use Hootsuite's email, use, move, move, use whatever you need to do to do real marketing. I'm not marketing to the people in Ralph's like shoving mac and cheese in their mouth. I'm marketing to the people that are like, my tummy hurts from this mac and cheese. I want something else. And so I'm not going to so try and th- convince someone that's not, that's still in it. I'm totally. trying to go to the people that are saying like, wow, look at your sales, look at your analytics. That stock photography is fine. You, you're alive, but like, you're not thriving. Let me help you move forward, up your game, level up and pay me for that and this is this is this is where we need to work together man is that Mm -hmm. you're entirely right when someone walks into ralph's or safeway they're a certain kind of person and changing their mind when they're already in safeway or costco 
to pay double price isn't going to happen. If someone walks into Whole Foods, they've already made a decision, which is I care about nutritious food. Mm-hmm. And so th- the analogy is the, the hub is Whole Foods and you're a brand at Whole totally. Foods. Totally, 100%. So, so 100%. What, what, what I have to do, and I'm not doing a good enough job doing, and I think this is where you and I need to work together and the other photographers on the platform need to work together, is I need to have a banner outside Whole Foods that basically says, we know we're twice as expensive and we're worth it. If you're tired of dying inside, come in. And if not, fuck off. Agreed. And And I think that it's also important to have, um, it's it's also important to, because brands look at each other, because I see it. We can can now, because of social media, transparently see brands interacting with other brands. So I can see this coffee company is looking at this other coffee company, which is looking at this other coffee company. And let's say coffee company A is in Ralph's. They're deep in Ralph's. And they're seeing that coffee company C is in Whole Foods. I want coffee company A in Ralph to see the imagery that I made for the Whole Foods coffee. I want them to see the quality of those images. I want them to see the production value. I want them to see the sales value of that and say, hmm, maybe we shouldn't be in Ralph's anymore. Like maybe we should step our game up and do what this coffee company did. Because at the end of the day, by doing that, you're raising everybody in the industry that's looking at each other. And I, okay. think, that it's, I think it's important to not, I don't, I don't wanna say like, if they're already drowning, let them drown. Cause it's, it's not about that. What I'm saying is like, just do good work and know what companies to go for to do that good work. And, and I know, I know deep down inside, like it, it, I have to believe this or else it's like, fuck it. Why am I doing this? I'm going to move to the woods and not just give up. I have to believe that if you do good work for coffee company, C that's in whole foods, your good work is going to make other companies jealous, make other companies feel insecure and make other companies step their shit up to be on that same level. And it's yeah. not going to work with everyone. I, I no, totally no, 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 and, that some, and that's okay. Companies... And that's and that's why Ralph's exists, and that's why Costco exists. I think yeah. I think what needs to happen is this union concept. These, these thoughts are all intertwined, right? Like, mm-hmm. if if Whole Foods exists and Whole Foods definitionally does not let in any brands that are bad for you, mm-hmm. the tighter it, it like. Like I remember the first time my mom went to Whole Foods and would turn around a label and then would turn around a label and then would turn around a label. And after the 40th label, it's like, okay, got it. Every, everything in here is good for me. Got it. I now understand that that's Whole Foods. So if the hub came to stand for quality, 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 in a desert of quality where everything else is shitty, uh, you know, mac and cheese or, or granola bars that are making you fat, and Whole Foods has the best stuff, then the kinds, you're right, not everyone will be converted, but the kinds of people that their tummy hurts and they want to they want to feel better, they will come to Whole Foods and they'll know where to shop and you build a loyal customer base. A really important part of a union, man, not to sound like a cult leader, is that you can't break rank. And so something we have to convey to the other- I fully agree. The, the, other, the other top 20 photographers, here's the risk, right? Remember how I was talking about your evil twin? Like, mm-hmm. let's say one of the other top 20 photographers on the hub is like, fuck it, I'm going to Suna. Now Suna has a really talented photographer. Four people do it, five people do it. And so now it's a little less clear to a brand, you know, where do I want to be on the shelves? Do I want to be at Whole Foods or do I want to be at Ralph's? It's a little less clear to a buyer of the brand to decide where to go if their tummy hurts. And so what we have to do is we have to hold the line. And as a group, I, you need both. You need Whole Foods I agree. To, have, to have the banner and say, this is where you come when you're tired of buying processed shit. And then you need every brand in Whole Foods to be like, I only sell in Whole Foods, right? And, and those two things together mean that when a client is looking for quality when they're ready for quality they know where to come and the shelves are stocked with beautiful high quality stuff that you make Mm -hmm. and if we can do that together then we can hold the line and charge what we need to charge i agree and i think that we need conversations between people because this goes back to like the, the the being in your own lane 
I don't think photographers talk to each other enough because there's fear there. Because there's fear that if I tell you something, like you said, it's that zero sum. Like if I give you a job, I don't get that job. And that's not true. That's not, that's, it's not true. And I think that there are some people out there, there, I, I can name off the top of my head, I can name two photographers, two out of every single photographer that I've ever seen in my entire life. I can name two photographers where I'm like, okay, maybe I won't give them advice because they're literally shooting exactly what I'm shooting. We're bidding on the same job. I'm getting jobs and they're pissed that I got that job. They're getting jobs. I'm pissed. Out of every photographer, there are only two photographers. That, and we all shoot the same. So maybe don't be friends with those photographers. Or if you right. are. But everyone maybe, else. Maybe if it is just a personal relationship versus a, versus a work relationship. But I think that everything else is, it, there needs to be that line of communication. Because it, without, it, we're, without it, we're just sitting ducks. And, or we're like in the dark when we're actually all just sitting in a room in the dark. And I think, so, um, I think that it's important and I, this is not going to be super, uh, I don't know how to say this without being like just kind of harsh, but like if people break ranks, treat a scab like a scab. Like we're not people that are during a protest, people that come in and work as scabs are like, they're not who I want to be. Like, I get that sometimes it needs to be done. I get that for those people, like they sometimes need to put food on the table and like they're going to do something that's not ideal to like make ends meet and make that happen. Fine. But that's not their full-time job. Like no one, no one has on their resume, like, oh, I follow protests and I work when other people are protesting. So that's like, like well, William, let's, let's try to bring this home because I know both of us have to wrap up in a couple minutes. Yeah. So this is what I think the plan should be. And I'd love for you to poke holes in this or tell me what you think should be added to it. And with the understanding that this is an ongoing dialogue between you and me, of course, we're becoming friends. We've talked about visiting each other's farms and stuff, um, but also with the other top photographers who I'm gonna send this video to. So here's my plan, right? Plan number one, we need a union. We need 20 photographers that are incredible, which we have in a Slack channel together, linking arms with me and Shannon, being like, we're on a team. And we're going to put a flag in the ground. And if one of us did it, that person gets trampled. But if 20 people do it with a big, powerful mm -hmm. platform, we have a chance to kind of actually, to use the term you used at the very beginning of this talk, set an industry standard. Mm -hmm. So number one is like unionize, like we are a team. Number two, communicate and act as a team. So as you said, like let's become friendly with each other, let's share information, all ships rise. Like the more jobs, the happier the clients are, like the, the, the better everyone does. And it's not you versus Sally versus Suzanne, it's three food photographers and Whole Foods fuck the world. You know what I mean? Like we're, it's us versus them. I, I agree. So that's number one is, is like unionize and team up. And then number two is like, here's what the hub's doing right now to and i've told you about this but this just so people have this isn't just an intellectual conversation between james and william this is like mm -hmm. you gave me some feedback and so we're putting some stuff into effect immediately mm -hmm. number one when brands bid on a job now or sorry when they post a job in the budget section it will say the average shoot on the hub is 740 dollars mm -hmm. we stand for quality above all else if you want quality yeah. content, you know, you should expect to pay at least $740 while brands sometimes spend less and are happy with the result. You know, it will be with more junior photographers with less experience. So we're just conditioning brands that there's a line in the sand and the plan, as I explained it to you is to move that line. So 740 right now will become mm -hmm. 760 in a couple months, 790, 820, and this time a year from now, it's a grand. And this time two years from now, it's, it's 1200 bucks and we're just moving yeah. the line. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is photographers can say why I bid this. So if you mm -hmm. bid 800 bucks and you and I have talked a lot about this, if the client says my budget's 500 to 750 and you bid 900 bucks, you should be able to explain and say, hi, this is why I did this. 
my time is worth $600. But based on what you asked for, I need to get a location, which is 200 bucks. I need a model, which is 150 bucks. And therefore, when you add that all together, it's 900 bucks. 100%, yeah. And that way you can explain to them, this is what's, it's, it's the equivalent of them turning around the nutrition label, right? They turn it around and they're like, mm -hmm. I understand why I'm paying extra because my God, these ingredients are perfect. And I understand what's inside the box, mm -hmm. right? And so we need to educate brands that it's not just like William making extra money. It's William taking the time to like get a location yeah. and do pre-pro and get a model and so on. And, and then th the last thing is, and I agree. And it's not, it's not even just the time. It's the quality of those ingredients as well. Like I know we somehow we got on like a, this food analogy train, but I'm, I'm into it because it's at the end of the day, if you are paying $20 for a block of mozzarella cheese, no one's going to pay 20 bucks for a block of cheese. They're going to be like, no, I can't just eat that block of cheese for dinner. That's, I'm not paying 20 bucks for that. But if you're telling them you're paying $20 for a block of cheese, pepperoni, dough, and sauce, they're like, oh yeah, I'd pay 20 bucks for a pizza. Like that, that can be my dinner. Like that can be my full complete situation. So I'm not asking clients to pay for a $750 block of cheese. I'm asking them to pay $750 for, like you said, a location, a model, the pre-production, stuff like that. And I think that the issue there, I, I can't imagine a client that's going to be like, oh no, we don't want that. I imagine that the clients just don't know that that's what they're doing. Like I think that's, think I think that's spot on. I think that's spot on, man. Like, I think they think when you bid higher, they're like, why is he charging 750 and this girl over here is charging 500? What's wrong? I think he's just trying to kind of scam us, but actually you're trying to help them. And so I think if they have the picture painted of like, oh, I now see what goes into the sausage. I now see that mm -hmm. the ingredients come together and make a pizza. Yeah. I think they understand that they're getting helped and not hurt. It is, it is fully helping them. Because like I said earlier, I have my bottom line. And whether you pay, like my bottom line, and it's not, this isn't always true because I, I, it does change depending on if this is like a full scale campaign to just like an Instagram situation. But I'm getting paid the same no matter what. So if you have a $500 budget, my rate stays the same. If there's not a huge difference, but a little bit of a difference, if it goes from 500 to 1200, I'm still getting paid the same. Like I'm not taking more of that money. And I think that the issue is that they don't understand that. Like you said, they, they don't, they're not seeing the whole pie. They're not seeing what goes into the sausage. Yeah. And that just goes back to educating them to say like, so, I'm not trying to steal your money, dude. I'm trying yeah, to make so, sure that so you have. So real quick, William, because we, we got to wrap up here. I just want to say like, so we have the thing in the, in the um, budget section where it says like, Quality costs 740. If you're paying less than that, you're getting processed shit. And so mm -hmm. you should pay more than that. The second thing is when the creator bids, she should be able to explain, this is why I'm bidding 1200 bucks. Here's what I cost. Here's what the props cost. Here's what the model costs. Here's what the location costs. And you're getting a whole goddamn meal. And I'm the one who's cooking it for you. And I'm not getting any mm -hmm. richer off of this. I'm actually doing you a favor. Okay. Um, and then two other things, and then I'll shut up. One is Shannon, Shannon and I are educating clients one by one. So you and I have done this a couple of times where you email me, you say, dude, I'm bidding higher. Can you explain to the client that it's worth it and why? And so we're manually just getting in the process of trying to mm -hmm. train clients like, okay, you are getting something better. You should pay for William. Here's why. And then the last thing is a page on our site that says, here's what other clients got and what they paid. And so it breaks down the pizza and it's like, this mozzarella is from this part of Italy and this pepperoni is from here and this dough mm -hmm. is from there. And this is Michael the chef. And it explains the shoot. And it's like, here are the 26 images he turned over and here are the, here are the favorite ones that the client had. And it cost 1200 bucks and here's why. Mm -hmm. and, and I've, that, I've seen that, I've seen that page and I think it's, phenomenal because I think that that's a really great way of of having like I said I'm not down for packages and I don't like a price list but it is good to show like historically this is what this is what you can get for how much budget you have and I so I think that that page I've never seen that anywhere else I've never seen any other platforms or any other companies have that 
And I think that it's, it truly is a really nice way of being not aggressive. You're not saying like, you can't come in the door unless you show me $1,200 cash, but you're saying like, this is our recommendation. And I, so I think it's, I think that page is yeah. critical. And listen, man, like I, I wrote a sales email. I, I have to go in a minute because I have another call, but um, I wrote a, a sales email to brands and I used this word omakase. Do you know what that means? Mm -mm. At a sushi restaurant, there's something called omakase. Okay. And the idea is like, you are white. I am white. Do we know like um, every, the ins and outs of Japanese culture and the best fish and what's seasonal and so on? No, we don't if, at a good sushi restaurant. So omakase means let the chef decide. The chef mm -hmm. knows what's best. So you literally pay a price and you just say, the, sh the chef knows, so I'll just eat whatever he wants to serve me because he knows. And so I, I think it's important to basic, as you said, it's like, you don't have to pay 1200 bucks. We have an a la carte thing. You can get California yep. rolls for all we care. But if you want the top of the line experience, we're the experts and we're telling you that it costs $1,200 and here's why. And again, it comes back to Whole Foods putting the flag in the ground and saying, all of us putting the flag in the ground. Yeah, together and saying like mm -hmm. this whole supermarket and everything inside it is saying this is why you're paying extra and it's worth it. Um, so let's mm -hmm. end it there, dude. I, I think that was good. And I think it explains, you know, I think we agree more than we disagree and hopefully uh -huh can through more of these discussions and maybe we in, invite other creators to join or, or whatever, but um, really come to a place where we all feel that we are putting that flag in the ground and working towards something together. Um, I just think the, yeah. the teamwork thing is of the utmost importance. Yeah. And I do, I think that I, I want to leave it with, I think the next time we talk, it's, I think it's important to discuss Kind of the same issue that Whole Foods is having right now, where Whole Foods does have this reputation for for being bougie, for being on a high horse. And I think that at this point in the industry, it's important for us as creators and as photographers to to do the outreach, like you used earlier, where if someone puts down a Whole Foods in the middle of Baltimore, it's not going to do well because people aren't going to be able to to go to that Whole Foods. So I do think, I'm not saying that it should be every time because I don't think that someone can survive doing every time, but I do think that there should be outreach where as a photographer, you're saying this brand, this brand in the middle of nowhere can't afford Whole Foods right now, but I'm going to give them this one shoot that's Whole Foods quality, but for Ralph's prices, but I'm going to make quite clear that this is, this is the intro into Whole Foods. This is to show them. Um, and I think, like I said, I think that's for next time. Like we, that's another system that we need to be working on. Yeah. To, and, and just so build. we're clear, just so we're clear. And I think there's a way to bring the creators in on this, but Shannon and I do that through discount codes. And the mm -hmm. reason we do that is because it makes a shoot that wouldn't be affordable, affordable. So you'd be shocked mm -hmm. how many of the $750 shoots on the platform are actually only costing the client 500. So we mm -hmm. do this already. And we're paying out of our pocket. We're not asking you to pay out of yours. But mm -hmm. once we really unionize, I think it makes sense for us to say, here are the 5, 10, 15 brands this month where we collectively as a group all want to take a 25% haircut. Decide and focus on 100%. Like, and, as, a, and, and as like, a photographer, me, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, William, like, do you like this brand? Cool. I do too. I'm the platform. You're the photographer let's together decide that we're going to both take a 25% haircut where like, I'm going to give them a discount code for half of that. And you're going to charge half, uh, like a mm -hmm. little bit less. And together we're going to make it so that someone who wouldn't be normally be able to afford us can. And once they taste how good the ingredients are, once they have the whole foods experience, the hope is that they figure out how to rework their budget and get to a place where now they can buy their groceries at Whole Foods. I totally agree. And like, I know you have to go and I think that that's definitely a conversation for next time, but I, I, wanted, I wanted to bring that up where it, it is a fine balance of being high quality, but not, not keeping the door shut to a lot of people. Like we don't, I don't want yeah. to be that photographer that has that Whole Foods reputation I want to be that photographer that has. Yeah, that it's it's ele it's elevated but not exclusionary, right? Like it's yeah, it's exactly. like it's aspirational but like accessible. 
Um, and we got to find a way to strike that balance. I got to go. Great talking to you as always, man. I appreciate your time. Good talking. We'll catch up again soon. Thanks, William. Bye, man.